This video is brought to you by Wren. What's up guys, Michael here and today we're looking at the hipster king of modern American cinema. Wes Anderson. Whether he's working with stop-motion canines, precocious high schoolers, or melancholy oceanographers, Wes Anderson's films are immediately recognizable for their colorful style, deadpan humor, and whimsical tone. Does it concern you that your daughter has just run away from home? And that's created a pretty fierce divide in opinion over whether he is a brilliant artist with a singular vision or a one-note cinematic poser. So are his films just a pretentious assortment of pastel colors and Bill Murray appearances, or is there something more profound going on? Why would a review make the point of saying someone's not a genius? You think I'm especially not a genius? I don't you... You didn't even have to think about it, did you? Let's find out in this wisecrack edition on Wes Anderson, Deep or Dumb. And as always, spoilers ahead. But before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to this video sponsor, Ren. Now, I don't know about you guys, but the constant bad news about climate change sucks. And the worst part is that I feel like there's nothing I can do about it. And this is where Ren comes in. Ren is a website that helps you calculate your carbon footprint and then shows you how you can offset your footprint by funding projects that do things like plant trees and protect rainforests. Rather than just feeling bad about the climate crisis with Ren, you can actually do something about it. All without having to spend all day outside getting sweaty and dirty while planting trees. All you have to do is answer a few questions about your lifestyle and Ren will calculate your carbon footprint and help you reduce it. Now, as much as I've tried, no one can reduce their carbon footprint to zero, but you can offset what you have left after reducing it on your own because you're already trying to reduce your carbon footprint on your own, right? Once you sign up to make a monthly contribution that will be used to offset your carbon footprint, you'll receive monthly updates from the projects you support. They'll actually send you pictures of trees that you planted so you can see what your money was spent on. And I mean, who doesn't want pictures of beautiful trees showing up in their inbox? Seriously, slide into my DMs, trees. We all know it's going to take a lot of work to slow down the climate crisis, so why not start today? We've partnered with Wren to protect five extra acres of rainforest for the first 100 people who sign up using our referral link. So go to www.wren.co slash join slash wisecrack to join us in saving the rainforest and fighting the climate crisis. That's wren.co slash join slash wisecrack. And now, back to the show. Now, before we can pass judgment on your favorite twee man, we should look at some hallmarks of his style. Visually speaking, Wes Anderson is one of the most instantly recognizable directors in the business. His movies are comprised almost entirely of flattened images shot via mostly flat camera movements, allowing each scene to play out like a series of pages from a picture book. This aesthetic is enhanced by a meticulous attention to production and costume design that accounts for every detail on the screen with a big emphasis on symmetry. He also tends to make use of a limited but vibrant color palette, matching each character's wardrobe to their environment in a way that removes any impression of realism. This adds to the sense that we're sort of watching a children's book come to life, only filled with smoking, sex, and prescription drugs. And sibling kissing. Did you say you're on mescaline? I did indeed. Very much so. Between the handcrafted look of the sets and the flatness of the composition, Anderson's style works to make the movie's whole world feel kind of staged. And he often literalizes this idea by framing his stories as books or plays. Anderson's singular style has brought him plenty of acclaim and adoration, but for those who don't find it so charming, it's easy to deride him as a classic case of style over substance, especially when taking into account his other trademarks. The type of comedy found in Anderson's films is uniformly deadpan, with characters delivering ridiculous lines in the most unaffected monotone. You're gonna steal his stuff. No, nah, we'll get it back to him. And juxtaposing their serious attitudes with the most absurd settings. She was dynamite in the sack, by the way. She was 84. Let me make sure you stop. Mm, I've had older. Between this brand of wry humor, the constant fetishization of retro objects, and the general sense of whimsy, it's easy to call Anderson a hipster filmmaker. And you know, it doesn't exactly help that the dude himself dresses like this. It's not just about the individual stylistic choices he makes either, but their cumulative effect. He uses all these signature elements to create an emotional distance between the audience and the film. And some critics take this ironic detachment as proof that there's nothing really going on beneath the film's pretty surfaces. But this disconnect is actually the whole point. 
Because beneath the bright tones and cheerful rock songs, all of Anderson's films are connected by an underlying thematic sense of loss and loneliness. See, Anderson chooses to tell stories about outsiders. Why don't you like me? Why should I? Nobody else does. His collections of orphans and oddballs are united in the fact that they don't seem to fit in anywhere. Not at home, at school, or even within their own families. And yet, the world around them is always so perfectly composed. A place for everything and everything in its right place. As a result, these very out-of-place outcasts stick out even more. What's more, Anderson uses his trademark deadpan comedy strategically to further the sense of outsiderness. You filthy goddamn pop fascist asshole! Beyond just giving great actors funny lines to read. Now I'm gonna go hunt down that shark, or whatever it is, and hopefully kill it. I don't know how yet, maybe dynamite. The actor's monotone delivery and impassive facial expressions give the characters a zoned out air, like they're walking through life in a fugue state, often with the help of some Indian cough syrup or other chemical enhancements. Anderson's comedic style is sort of the inverse of the MCU's trademark quippiness. Rather than making lighthearted jokes in the face of grave danger, then you have seen Ragnarok, the fall of Asgard, the great prophecy. Now, hang on, hang on. I'll meet. <laughs> Back around shortly. Anderson's heroes speak with absolute seriousness, no matter how absurd their situation gets. I notice you're on a fencing team. Well, I try my hardest to start one up for you guys. The scenario may be funny, but the characters aren't in on the joke. I wrote a suicide note. Is it dark? Of course it's dark. It's a suicide note. Externally, most of Anderson's characters enjoy lives of material comfort and success, and this is complemented by their rich, vibrant costumes. But beneath the fabulous attire, these people are plagued by a shared sense of emptiness. What's more, their emotional state is mirrored by the world around them. A world that is uniformly pretty, but in an artificial, unlived-in way. And that's true whether we're talking about Mr. Fox's stop-motion treehouse or the Tenenbaum's primary colored mansion. They all seem more like luxurious dollhouses, rather than places containing the messy lives and emotions of real people. And so the characters invariably remain emotionally isolated from the fairy tale world around them. And when you understand this sense of underlying melancholy as the thematic through line of Anderson's work, his whimsical style becomes a lot more meaningful. Take his trademark shots in which the exterior of a building is lifted away to reveal a cross section of the rooms inside, literalizing the idea of the set as a living dollhouse. It's more than a cute visual flourish. Each of these shoebox dioramas, as they have been called, is curated with the utmost care and warmth, with the camera calling attention to specific objects and minor details. It's the sort of loving display you might get from a collector or a person fondly examining the objects of their childhood. Dollhouses, dioramas, and keepsakes all provide us with a means to preserve the past, paralyzing it so that we can put it on display. And that is exactly the problem that most of Anderson's protagonists face. Each is trapped inside the paralyzed frames of their own emotional past, unable to move forward or accept their loss of innocence. For example, the Tenenbaum siblings are all gifted kids whose childhoods were cut short by their success, and whose lives stopped making sense once they were no longer child prodigies. So it makes sense that as adults, Chaz duplicates himself through his twin sons, while Margot maintains a teenage rebellion against parents that have long since stopped caring. Both are desperate attempts to return to an idealized family life that for them never really existed. I always wanted to be a Tenenbaum, you know? Me too. And similarly, in the Darjeeling Limited, the Whitman brothers are struggling with the loss of their father, the disappearance of their mother. I spoke to your mother. She's not coming. She didn't get on the plane. And the general deterioration of their brotherly bonds. Their journey across India is really about recapturing their childhood, though it's also a great opportunity to get laid in train bathrooms and buy snakes. Yes, the past happened. But it's over, isn't it? Not for us. Even the slightly older and more settled protagonists, like Mr. Fox and Steve Zizou, are tethered to the past. Both of them are marooned in midlife crises, trying to recapture their daring days as reckless young men rather than respected patriarchs. Mr. Fox's crisis even leads to him getting his tail blown off in a masculation metaphor that would make Freud blush. Tails don't grow back. I'm gonna be tailless for the rest of my life. And the Grand Budapest Hotel ties this idea into the arc of history at large. It's framed as a storybook in which Zero reminisces about the hotel's heyday and its fall from grace. 
Throughout, the concierge longs for a more civilized past, as do those around him. You see, there are still faint glimmers of civilization left in this barbaric slaughterhouse that was once known as humanity. Indeed, that's what we provide in our own modest, humble, insignificant... Oh, f it. The immediate contrast between the luxurious colors of the hotel in its prime and its drab present-day existence visually communicates the backwards yearning that plagues basically all of Anderson's heroes. In each case, this yearning is less for a specific time and place, and more for the sense of innocence, decency, and adventure that it represents. A world that feels the way that it looks. A world that, outside the confines of a Wes Anderson movie screen, can never really exist. But Anderson films don't allow us to simply bask in nostalgic, color-coordinated scenes, because his bright storybook tales are unfailingly interrupted by moments of sudden violence. Fingers are severed and tails are blown off, helicopters crash and hapless burglars are brutalized. In these instances, the nostalgic fairy tale atmosphere is suddenly shattered, interrupted by a violent blast of reality. Sometimes this leads to pure slapstick. But often, these eruptions are played completely straight, delivering some of the film's most affecting moments, especially when the violence is self-inflicted. When Francis Whitman removes his bandages to reveal the scars from his suicide attempt, or Richie Tenenbaum slashes his wrist, the whimsy suddenly goes out the window. Untidy gouges and flowing red blood can't be woven into the rest of Anderson's orderly aesthetic. In these moments, the pain that's been submerged beneath the deadpan demeanors and vibrant costumes comes bursting to the surface. Indeed, the violent moments in The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou and Fantastic Mr. Fox reveal the full cost of both protagonists' terminal nostalgia. Each enjoy a picture-perfect present, which they trade in an attempt to reclaim part of their past. And those around them pay the price. The Tenenbaum family has remained externally frozen in time, with each member using a different method to remain emotionally catatonic. But the passing of years still takes its toll, culminating in Richie's suicide attempt. And in the Grand Budapest Hotel, history marches on, crushing the hotel beneath its jackboot. Still, Gustav and Zero endure heavy casualties in their battle to keep the building spirit alive. In Anderson's films, it seems that no one is immune to the passage of time, no matter how meticulously they try to preserve the past. In fact, the only way Anderson's heroes can ever find peace is by finally abandoning the past that they cling to and the keepsakes they obsess over. Take the Whitmans. They spend their whole journey arguing over possessions, especially those inherited from their father, like the monogram suitcases they lug everywhere. We learn via flashback that they were even late for his funeral because they were so determined to drive his car there. Tell them we'll be there in five minutes. They instill all these objects with a kind of totemic power, taking them as a proof of their father's love, their own sense of belonging, and a connection to their younger selves. But those days of yore are long gone, and these characters have to accept that, which they finally do at the end in a triumphant scene where they literally let go of their baggage. The metaphor is somehow as compelling as it is annoying. Dad's bags aren't gonna make it! No matter what ridiculous scenarios their story takes them through, pretty much all of Anderson's heroes go through this same grieving process, culminating with them finally learning to just let go. Mr. Fox accepts the loss of his tail and his youthful vitality, embracing a new chapter in his family's life. Sally and Sam return to real life, with the warm memory of their days in the Moonrise Kingdom to steady their resolve. Each of the Tenenbaums manage to move on from their frozen state, with Chaz letting his kids run a little freer, Eli checking into rehab, Richie finally confessing his love for Margot, and Margot turning their whole crazy family story into a new play. And then there's Zero, who initially seems like a ghost haunting the ruins of the once beautiful hotel clinging to the bricks and mortar long after everyone that made it special has gone. But in his final words, he outlines exactly why each of Anderson's heroes need to just chill out and enjoy the gorgeous worlds they're in. The hotel I keep for Agatha. We were happy here. For a little while. There's a Japanese term which sometimes gets used to describe the heart of Anderson's work. Mono no aware. It means an awareness of the impermanence of things, and the sense that this is both sad and sort of beautiful. And it's this feeling that runs through each of Anderson's movies. Even the happier endings tend to be tinged with loss, like the death of the titular Royal Tenenbaum, the collapse of the Moonrise Kingdom, or the decay of the Grand Budapest Hotel. 
because ultimately, no matter how much of ourselves we pour into something or how diligently we work to preserve it, nothing lasts forever. But we can still be happy where we are, at least for a little while. They say our tree may never grow back, but one day something will. It's easy to take a glance at one of Wes Anderson's fussily arranged frames and dismiss him out of hand as nothing but an aging hipster with a solid visual flair. But his vibrant worlds actually provide us with vivid depictions of what it is like to feel terminally out of place, with the sense of loneliness and loss that comes with the simple passage of time. And every one of his stylistic quirks is absolutely vital in evoking this melancholy. So our verdict is that Wes Anderson is, in fact, deep. But what do you guys think? Have we convinced you that there's more to Anderson than meets the bespectacled eye, or is he just making fairy tales for drunk adults? Let us know in the comments. Thanks as always to our patrons for all your support. Slay that subscribe button like it's the jaguar shark who ate your best friend, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later. We good? Okay.